All right, after several weeks of uh, intense testing, measuring, and very heavy use of my uh, specific gravity meter, we finally have these batteries in a condition where I'm happy to say I can be rather confident in installing all eight of them into the solar bank. They have been tested to about 635 amp hours, which is about 75% of the original rated capacity at a 10 amp rate. So I am very happy with that, and it's rather impressive for 10 year old batteries to perform that well. So this room is flooded as per usual, so I bought some tiles, which cost more than all the batteries combined. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be installing these underneath the batteries as well and I'm also going to be ruling out a few of the less uh, reliable parts in the current system namely this one because these seem to very often suffer from shorted cells so in a parallel, massively parallel system like this that's something you absolutely want to avoid I'm also considering removing this one since it's only got about 20 amp hours of capacity and this one here for no real reason other than to make more room I have no reason to distrust it but it's only 40 amp hours as well this one might also go because it's just generally strange and when I reconditioned it it was a very bubbly and warmy getty so I think this one might have a rather high self-discharge rate. Also, the shape of the case just doesn't install me with confidence. So <laughs> Mostly, I want to guard myself from shorted cells. That's why I'm going to be removing this one. The rest are probably staying. I have not, in my diggings, come across uh, more than one truck battery of this caliber that has had a shorted cell and that one had <laughs> handled it very well the plastic case had expanded on it as the trucks probably rather heavy duty alternator had pumped it full of a lot of juice and it had bulged a bit but it had finally gone open circuit <laughs> without any major damage done and I'm looking at much smaller currents here since even if one of these batteries were to get a short itself uh, they would, it would essentially just be fed by the rest of the batteries which drop to a rather low voltage under load compared to an alternator so these big guys are staying that's also in part because they are rather clumsy to move around they don't have too much capacity but they are about 80 amperes on average, so it's a lot more than the other ones I'm going to be removing. I think this one's about 60, this one's about 60, that one's 40, and that one's uh, about 2017, I think, so they're really rather worn out. And the worst one of these has 25 amperes in it, which isn't too impressive. However, these are going to have far superior cycle performance, so I can expect more reliability over a longer period of time. The biggest uh, part of this project is going to be just disconnecting this old wiring harness and recommissioning it for the new batteries because as you can see all of these have these car battery style lugs on them which have just for the most part screwed proper cables onto but there are those where they places where they are actually connected like that which I would need to re-terminate in order to use with the telecom batteries however I do have a fair amount of unused proper pre-terminated wiring lying around a lot of it just happens to be extremely stiff very high gauge very low conductor count wiring so it might be a bit clumsy to find cables which are suitable length and of course in pairs but I should be able to get around 
without having to do too much cable work. So, time to get at it. This is going to be a rather major procedure. And there we have our initial setup for the new batteries. I have tiled the floor, most of it anyway. I don't want to buy more of these tiles than I have to, so that one's going to have to be empty for a while while I figure out what to do with it. And I've spaced the batteries rather generously using a suitable tool just so that I can easily get in and feel around and inspect the electrolyte levels and so forth. It's important to just keep an eye on everything since I'm running a massively parallel system that is not fused as it should be. Ideally I should have a fuse between every battery but the budget just does not allow for that at the moment so vigilance will have to do and of course the large main breaker in case of an overload condition. Fusing every battery individually really does not provide too much protection against shorted cells either way which is what uh, the individual battery fuse would protect against since the impedance of these batteries just is not low enough to cause a huge surge current to rush through the fuse if, for instance, this battery were to be fused with, it would have to be run at about 50 amps or so in order to allow the safe operation of the entire bank at its rated 100-ish amp load. Now, if this battery were to get a shorted cell with that uh, configuration, there's no way it would really be drawing in excess of 50 amps from one side of a bank. It would be drawing, have to draw more than 50 amps from both this side of a bank and that side of a bank since there would be one fuse for each side and uh, yeah that just wouldn't happen the impedance is too high the, the battery the voltage of these batteries which are okay would drop the voltage of this one would be forced very high for a five cell battery and it would just boil itself out over a period of hours and uh, turn open circuit essentially so that is my justification for not spending the extra money on individual battery fuses I simply do not think they would add any protection against uh, shorted cells beyond that I know I just need to route all the wires I need to find enough jump links to parallel everything up. We are running a few more batteries than we did before and I'm also probably going to change the polarity or rather where the battery cables are connected because we have our positive going in here right now and since the positive is on the left side of every battery it is more practical to have a positive outlet here so the cable will just go along the bank there, rather than across thin air, enabling clumsy people like me to stumble across it and destroy everything. So I just need to start sorting through my wiring. All these boxes are filled with premium grade TV transmitter wiring, used. And I hope that I have enough to get it sorted. I also need to find enough M8 bolts to keep everything hooked together with these fancy terminals since I'm reasonably certain that I can't use these on these batteries even if I wanted to. Nope, that's just not going to happen. And I might also be putting one of the other batteries in here, one of the ones that are already brought out of the room since there is space for one and uh, for instance that large strange battery I yeah it might be workable we'll see it'll depend on how much wiring I can scrunch up and how much I can be bothered I should also know that uh, I have put some thought into how I've arranged, arranged these batteries 
in that the ones that are least likely to fail, number one, two, three, and four, these have tested the best, are placed, well, walled in by other batteries. Whereas uh, these two, number seven and eight, which are older than the rest and a bit worn, but are very light by comparison, are placed, well, somewhat easy to get to. Whereas number six and five here, which have measured the poorest, are just placed easy to access in case of failure. And I have placed these two batteries right in the middle of the telecom batteries. And that is because these two, being starter batteries, are going to have somewhat lower impedance than the telecom batteries. The fully charged loaded down voltage when I've tested these has been around 12.5 volts, whereas the loaded down voltage of these is around 12 volts. So it is uh, a good thing to have these in the middle of the chain. Since the cables running between the batteries are all in series with each other, so the batteries which are in the middle of the chain, so to speak, are going to be under the least amount of load, and the ones closest to the ends, at the moment this one and that one, are going to see the deepest discharges. However, if these two have a lower impedance than the end batteries, they are going to be able to supply a bit extra current, so it'll equalize the voltage drops across the cable, so just a little bit and decrease wear on these and increase wear on these, which is what you want. So, enough babbling, time to get wiring. Well, 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 as luck would have it, there's going to be a lot less of this spaghetti in my solar system from now on because I just remembered that I had a fair few rather heavy duty copper grounding bars that I salvaged lying around which I had just intended to sell for scrap price once the price of copper got a bit better around here however I don't think I'll be doing that. Doesn't that look fancy or what? It did upset my initial battery planning a bit, but I really, really do like the look of this. This bar is a bit longer than I'd like, but it's not so long that I'll bother cutting it. They were pretty much perfect length and they had a whole bunch of pre-drilled M4 holes at pretty reasonable spacing so I just cut a few of them up to M8 and uh, cut up some studs which are penetrating about a centimetre into the poles there and this is what we end up with. Uh, gotta sit down. This is a just a normal metal steel stud. I would like to have used brass or copper, but I make do. I had some copper uh, steel threaded, whatever they are called, lying around. I also would have used to, would have liked to use only brass nuts, but well, I've almost used up every single nut I had lying around the house. I'm going to have to actually go and purchase some because I think I have about five left in total. Either way, the bars are. I had to make these start rather long so the bars would clear these uh, uh, caps which go over the refilling. Holes so, so that I can actually get the corks out and measure the specific gravity of the batteries and of course top them up. 
I could have just gone without these blue things, but yeah, it's a bit uh, better. It looks a lot nicer, and since this room has some issues with crap from outside getting in because there are some vents up by the ceiling, I don't mind having a bit more dirt protection for my batteries. This is just a piece of 50 square millimeter cable hooking the two different width chains up and I did run out of <laughs> those ganged starter thingies so these batteries have a couple of just short things from the transmitter they are pretty much going up to the top of this not there they are brass though so that's good but I'm going to have to make some better ones so that I can actually access the refill caps on these since, well, I can't do anything with them at the moment but they have a reasonable electrolyte level so it should be good for a little while I know that one of these big batteries really desperately needs a bit of a refill but I'm actually out of battery water as well hmm. either way, now I've just got to Hook these two up to the remaining batteries there, as well as those two, which are yet to be figured out where they're supposed to go. They'll probably end up somewhere around there. I'll find some suitable cables and then I'll tap the positive or negative off of one of those. I won't tap it straight off a telecom battery, although that would be better for the load matching. Either way, I'm willing to make some compromises to have a system looking as fancy as this. Although I think I'm going to have to put a, <laughs> a sign on the door warning people about not bringing long metal objects in here because if you drop a crowbar across those, there's going to be some sparks flying. And there we go. All connections are made. The telecom batteries are hooked up to the truck batteries. Those two random batteries are hooked up as well. I couldn't I decided to not put them right at the end just out of mobility reasons and it was a bit messy routing cables around here. So I just hooked them up there and there. This little bit of copper strip there. I strongly doubt it has any considerable resistance in it that's going to cause any damage to those two batteries. I also did hook my positive up from there and my negative from there so I have swapped that around. I've also redone the negative cabling on the truck batteries since this actually used to be is 16 square millimeter single of this wire cable which was fine since I wasn't tapping the negative off here so the only current running through this cable was the current running from these three batteries however with my negative being tapped off here I'm looking at uh, essentially all my load going through this cabling so it needs to be yeah, 35 millimeter or above and that's done. This trip here is probably the thinnest uh, cable in the entire system, being two 16 square millimeter cables. What's that? About 32 square millimeters. So it's all right. And I'm not entirely sure about what kind of cable this copper bar equals, but it's fairly thick stuff. So. I think that'll be 35mm at the very least. It was coupled up with 35 square millimeter grounding cable on the side it was installed, so that's probably what it's uh, sized for. These grounding bars are of course just uh, manufactured in a way that they are supposed to handle extreme ground currents for a short amount of time without having too high voltage drops so that they can short away any gigantic uh, 
earthing fault and trip for breaker. Anyway, I'm now measuring the voltage drop from over all the entire positive side of the bank just sitting idly. There's some drop going on because these batteries are, are not at all equally charged, so they are slowly equalizing each other and setting to the same cell voltages. But I think we are ready to flick the main breaker. Because I'm reasonably certain my polarity is correct. So we'll disconnect that. We'll lose a lot of lighting. Let's see what happens. Ta da! Lights running off a battery. All 300 milliamps of it. Might as well turn on my panels as well. Two millivolt drop at two amps. Yeah, now I've just got to measure around a bit and then do a load test and see if I have any hot spots or things that need attention. I know that this connection turned out to be a bit ugly because I couldn't get it on quite straight, but I think that brass washer is going to make the most of it. I'm going to have to keep an eye on it, that's all. Alright, so I've got my trusty old mi the uh, various power fan here. It's got 650 and 1350 and 2000 watt settings. The inverter can only handle the 650 watt setting, but it should be enough to Give us an estimate, and it's bloody cold in here, about 8 degrees Celsius. Great for batteries, but less great for people working on them. So, we're still measuring the voltage drop across the negative string here, which is because of that dodgy connection there is on the negative side. So, if that's bad, we're going to see some excessive voltage drop here. Now, I'm not entirely sure what I should expect. We're probably looking at about 70 amps of draw for this fan, so let's go. Sixty-seven millivolts drop. That's not too bad I think. And quite spot on 70 amps. So let's just compare that to the positive side. And we'll have 62. So I don't think that connection is too bad, but I'm going to have to keep an eye on it. And of course, I'm going to have to recharge my batteries from the grid after doing this. But yeah, it's worth it because things like this need to be tested. I can't just jump straight into it with an unreliable system. And we're now heating the room up at pretty much the maximum. Now with this vertical handle, just over a kilowatt out, using an electric heater and a few light bulbs. And I must say, these copper bars are rather impressive, because you know, we're measuring the voltage drop across this long one, and we have a grand total of 13 millivolts. Now, it's a bit hard to estimate the current running through it since it's going to be different all along the chain, but since it's about in the middle of everything, it should be fairly high. And the current here close to the end is. Well, here it's just 20 amps. <laughs> it was a bit higher before. Yeah, this end we have almost 80 amps. So, 13 millivolts is 
quite acceptable, to say the least. And the negative side does indeed have a slightly higher voltage drop, but uh, I did some math, and it's not because of this dodgy connection here. Indeed, this has a resistance of uh, about 140 micro ohms, which just isn't isn't anything to talk about. This jumper link has higher resistance than that. The high voltage drop of about 50, 60 millivolts comes from just this jumper link here having a slightly dodgy connection as well as having a jumper link here in order to compensate for the different width batteries. The voltage drop is not quite as high as about 10 millivolts across here but yeah, that's about as much as this entire bar on its own, so it does speak for itself. Rather, when dealing with currents as ridiculously high as these, every little bit does count. The bank is performing admir admirably, though. I don't think it's dropping below 12 volts even under this high load, but I haven't checked it for a little while. Nope, 12.05 volts. Of course, that is uh, the worst case scenario since it's being tapped off the loaded end. It's going to measure a lot better if we ignore all the voltage drops in the cables and just measure across the unloaded <laughs> end. There we go, 12.3. So we have a total of 0.3 volts of drop in these entire cable and copper bar runs which I'm quite happy with there's not a lot of resistance in the systems system at all and uh, I remember in the first iterations of the systems I pretty much had uh, almost an entire volt of voltage drop in the cables alone before they even got into these long connection cables that run into the breaker box so all in all this system should be good to go now. Of course, there's no sun in the winter here in Finland. Oh, well, practically none. I get about perhaps a hundred watts out of my panels per day, not per hour. So, essentially, the system is just sitting dormant and waiting for better days. And with that, I think it's starting to become time to round off this video. Uh, I just did the Math and uh, redid my capacity calculations, considering that I've shed a few batteries, three or four of them. And this bank now has a capacity of about 1200 amp hours at 12 volts and 140 amps load nominal, or about 14.5 kilowatt hours total capacity. So that's <laughs> That's a fair bit of usable power, however, the safe, so to speak, capacity is still only about 2.9 kilowatt hours, and I count that as 20% depth of discharge, because if I don't discharge the batteries more than about that far, it doesn't really matter how long it takes to recharge them, because sulfation isn't going to be very critical at that stage it's just equivalent to a battery sitting for a while so yeah three kilowatt hours yeah, usable capacity without risking damage to the batteries in case I don't get in the sun now of course if I for, if we run into a another extended power outage as we had just a short while ago I can of course use a lot more of that power as long as I recharge the batteries from the grid. A 50% depth of discharge isn't really that big of a deal, especially not for the new telecom batteries. But uh, yeah, I don't think the, these other automotive batteries are going to be too happy with many 50% discharge cycles. But for, for all intents and purposes, 3 kilowatt hours of usable capacity is pretty much for the size range I need for the size of this system. Again, I just only have a pair of 
235 watt panels in a not very favorable location. So this bank should suffice for my daily needs. The next step would be to upgrade the actual panels but uh, of course that costs money and I don't like spending money uh, and of course I'm going to keep on looking for free and cheap batteries hoping to uh, find, uh, in, at some stage to run only telecom batteries I would like to get rid of those big truck batteries and these two to be frank could could still have a lot of use in their intended uh, areas, i.e. automotive stuff, because they are in great shape, they're practically brand new, so it's a bit of a shame cycling them to death when they're not built for it. But anyway, thank you for watching, I hope you find this a bit interesting at least. I certainly did enjoy building it, except it was a bit of a pain sitting around here in this room since it's about well, it's essentially outside temperature in here, which is great for batteries. Very great for batteries, but it makes my fingers cease functioning. Yeah. Cheerio.